Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the January 2023 session of the Georgetown Center for Business and Public Policies, Little Nuggets of Tech and Telecom with Carolyn and Jen Fritchie. Hi, Jen. Happy Hi, 2023. Carolyn. Happy 2023. Happy New Year. Thank you very much. And um, I'm going to leave it to you to introduce our very special speaker to kick off the year. I, I thought it was particularly I don't know, well planned by us that our December session didn't work out because I think hearing from our guest speaker today is a really good way to kick off the year and have an understanding of what maybe the business is in this sector, the sector being broadband access, connection and connectivity are going to be facing. So looking forward to the chat. Terrific. Well, without further ado, I want to introduce our speaker. We have today Dave Schaefer. Dave is the CEO and founder of Cogent Communications. Dave and I have known each other, gosh, Dave. Uh, we're, well, Dave. We, we don't want to admit to that, Jennifer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Multiple years slash decades almost. And um, Dave, when I was an analyst, I followed Cogent. And I will never forget my first meeting with Dave when I sat down in his offices in DC and said, so I hear you're a CLEC, tell me about that. And what, I, Dave, if you remember this conversation, you said, well, we're not exactly a CLEC. <laughs> and you went on to talk about what what Cogent is. So maybe we'll start there and um, just tell us for those in the audience who aren't familiar with Cogent, um, who you are and what you do. Okay, well, first of all, thanks everyone for their time. I'd like to thank Professor Mayo and the Georgetown Business School for this venue and all of our guests who have taken time out of their busy day to join us today. So thanks everyone. You know, Cogent was founded 23 years ago with a handful of basic principles. The internet would be the only network that mattered, bandwidth as a commodity, and as such, you needed to be a low-cost producer to survive. Local access is a natural monopoly, and if you are an overbuilder, you need to be thoughtful and selective about where you built. Uh, because in telecom, marginal cost is always below average cost, getting scale matter. Your cost of subscriber acquisition is actually your largest single cost. And the only way to outmarket incumbents is to have a compelling value proposition. And then finally, maybe the most important of all of these principles was the rate of technological change in the underlying technologies that produce internet service. So while a company sells internet access, what they are actually producing are interface routed bit miles connected to other networks. And the two incremental technologies are wave division multiplexing, which for a 35 year period has had a compounded rate of deflation of 80% per year. The second key technology is optically interface routing, which has a roughly 40% compounded rate of deflation for the past 29 years. And you as a service provider need a network architecture that can capture these advances more effectively than legacy networks. So what Cogent did is set out to build a global internet backbone and access business running IP directly over DWDM, protected at layer three, using ethernet as the interface and connecting to two discrete customer bases, corporate end users in North America that reside in the central business districts of major cities in multi-tenant skyscrapers. Today, we have a little over 1 billion square feet of office space directly on net. That represents about 12% of the North American multi-tenant office inventory by square footage. Yet we connect to less than 2,000 buildings. Our second segment 
is connecting to carrier neutral data centers globally. Cochin's network is comprised of 61,000 route miles of inner city fiber connected to 18,000 route miles of metropolitan fiber, 219 markets, 51 countries, and in addition to those skyscrapers, we connect to 1,500 carrier neutral data centers. Cogent today carries approximately 24% of global internet traffic, about 1.1 exabytes a day of traffic. The average bit on the public internet travels about 2,800 miles. It passes through about 2.9 networks or autonomous systems and about three and a half routers between origin and destination. What we are producing are those interface routed bit miles at the absolute lowest cost in the industry. Cogent's corporate business, while accounting for 57% of our revenues, only accounts for 3% of our traffic volume. Our service provider business, which is highly commoditized, has experienced an average compounded rate of deflation for 20 years of 23% per year. That trend is going to continue going forward. And as the price comes down, the volumes increase for three reasons. More people use the internet. They spend more minutes a day using the internet and the bid intensity of those applications increase. So a long-winded answer to Jennifer's opening, but we are a ISP, not a CLAC. <laughs> but very well data-driven. Well, Dave, <laughs> let's, let's break that down a little bit because you do have a very, maybe just looking at your corporate side first, you mentioned it's 50, if I wrote it down right, 57% of your revenue. You have over 2,000 buildings. Obviously, the economy and the, the work from, you're probably in the building I'm sitting in, 155 Wacker right now um, in Chicago. But you look at like LaSalle Street, for example, Chicago has been essentially hollowed out with the pandemic. Are you seeing, how are you seeing that impact your business? So we are definitely in your building and Green Hill is a customer of ours. So you yeah. are using Cogent. So Cogent's corporate business for basically 17 years grew almost like clockwork at about 11% per year. We actually only had two negative sequential quarters of growth over that 17 year period. And that was at the height of the great recession. The pandemic has been very challenging for that business. Mm -hmm. We have seen our growth rate go from positive 11% to negative 8%. We have, as the pandemic has waned, recovered and we're back to about 1% positive growth, but nowhere near the 11% that we had experienced historically. And that's really due to corporate uncertainty, as well as an increase in vacancy in the buildings we serve. Pre-pandemic, the average building we served had 6% vacancy. That peaked at just over 18%. It has been reduced to about 177 but still far above historical averages. Also, what we have seen is the average new lease tends to be for about 20% less square footage. The average corporate user pre-pandemic designed their networks to accommodate 97% of employee workdays in office, 3% remote. Today, that design criteria is 60% of workdays in the office, 40% remote. So we are seeing a recovery, but it is slow and it is geographically uneven. Pacific Northwest, 
San Francisco, probably the worst markets, uh, probably Miami, Houston, Dallas, the best in North America, and markets like D.C., Chicago, and New York are somewhere in between. Can I ask a quick question about um, that, that very point, the markets? What are your thoughts about these, um, uh, I don't know what they call them now, ex-urban, there's they're something more than suburban. So I'm thinking here based in Northern Virginia, Tysons, right? They've got millions of square feet that are going up, brand new buildings. Some of them are mixed use condos and retail. Others are just straight up office buildings. Does that become a space that you guys um, you begin to consider as opposed to what you had described as a focus on you know, very specific areas within downtown business districts, et cetera? So we do have a handful of suburban clusters uh, where there are large buildings, the Gallery in Houston, Tyson's in this market, a uh, portion of Stanford in uh, Connecticut. But in general, we need three things to be true to justify the capital to build into a building. It needs to be large. It needs to have a very diverse base of tenants and it needs to be tightly clustered with other buildings. So one of the things that makes Cochin's network truly unique is we did not build any of the intercity or metro fiber. We bought dark fiber from 306 different companies that had constructed that globally. The only thing that Cochin builds is the short lateral from a manhole in front of the building into and out of the building and the riser infrastructure in the building. In those suburban examples that you gave, typically the buildings tend to be smaller, fewer tenants, and more diffuse. So while we will look at them, part of the way Cochin survived the telecom meltdown is being extremely focused, knowing what we're good at and staying away from things we're not good at. <laughs> so I'm, not, I'm gonna turn it back over to you, Jim, but I just had uh, one more question. Sure. You mentioned earlier about uh, needing to, to keep your eye on and take advantage of the rate of technological change. I was curious, as you look out into the next you know, five, 10 years, are there any, you know, promising different or new technologies that would, you know, improve or help your bottom line? And or do you just see iterations of what we already have in the marketplace and already out in the networks? So in many ways, the internet is one of those inventions that defines a millennium. Uh, there will be a point in time when the internet will be obsolete and fiber optic technology will be obsolete. But those are beyond our investable horizon. You know, the internet is really just getting started. What makes the internet so powerful is the fact that for the first time in global history, we now have a unified global market with 5.3 billion active users out of 7.5 billion people. And then secondly, Every one of those users can also be an entrepreneur and come up with a new idea. And I think it is that innovation, as well as the porting of legacy applications that are driving internet growth. Uh, the underlying technologies, I think, will continue to evolve. So everyone's familiar with Moore's Law, which has a 55% compounded rate of price performance improvement as measured by millions of instructions per second. Moore's Law, however, is bumping up against the physical constraints of material science. We're down to three nanometer traces and several gigahertz clock speeds. At the end of the day, we can't make the traces smaller because they're down to one atom in width, and the clock speeds can't be increased because the heat dissipation of the silicon is just not able to keep up with higher clock speeds. So as a result, we're starting to see Moore's Law bump up against those physical limits. In the two technologies we have, we have probably decades more 
of advancements. You know, in a single strand of fiber, you have thousands of terahertz of bandwidth. Compare that to tens or hundreds of megahertz that are auctioned off for tens of billions of dollars in mobile systems. And it is not a shared medium since it's each user. Today, we're only using about 12 terahertz of those thousands. We're only modulating at about four and a half bits per hertz. Shannon's limit would take us up to about 9.2 bits per hertz. So we have a long way to go in DWDM. Uh, we've seen the advent of first 100, 400, 800 gig, now even 1.2 gigabit per second per wavelength. We've seen wavelength counts go from four to 160 and will expand the bands. On the routing side, the room for innovation is just as great, but the market has been a duopoly for 28 years, 29 years, Cisco and always one other player. You know, the key advances there are better route processing. You know, most route processors today are still using 19 nanometer chipsets, whereas today's microprocessors in a phone or a PC are seven nanometers. So we have a long way to go in getting a much lower cost per packet forwarded. So the underlying technologies have a long way to go. The applications have a long way to go. So the internet's here for a while. Steve, if I could ask a bigger picture question, you've always had, you know, I would say you've been bearish on telecom. I, I don't know if that you'd agree with that statement, but yet when I was an analyst, Cogent was one of the few, if not the only company to be growing its top line. So fast forward three years, there's been, you know, the cloud companies, this, you know, the Azure's, the Google's, the obviously the AWS are getting into the telecom world. Where do you see that tension? Or do, are they friends, frenemies, foes? How do you see that playing out? So first of all, for investors, telecom has been an ugly nightmare. It's been an industry that's destroyed several trillion dollars of enterprise value over a 20 year period. Telecom peaked in 2000 at about four and a half percent of GDP in the OECD countries. Today, it's down to 1.2% in that same universe of countries and will probably continue to decline to below a half a percent of GDP. And that seems almost oxymoronic to a casual investor who sees everyone using their phones and computers more. But the internet is so deflationary to the ecosystem and it's really empowered two things to happen. All legacy applications that were on purpose-built networks, whether it be voice, managed security services, or video distribution, all to port to the internet. And then concurrently, it's allowed new applications like a Facebook or a search application to be developed. And we're really, I think, just scratching the surface there. I think for the cloud providers and hyperscale operators, their businesses are dependent on networks. Right. I don't believe they want to be in the network business. Networks are complicated, they're expensive, and they take a long time to build. What they want is someone else to deploy that capital and then they want to sell the application layers on top of that. Their businesses have natural monopoly attributes, such as the scale of search or the network effect of a social network or the wider distribution of content, the Netflix, you know, amortizing that production cost over a larger universe. All of those 
are attributes that build natural monopolies. Why go out and try to overbuild someone who already has a monopoly, trick them into building it? So uh, I think they will be an important part of the ecosystem. The final point is that you know, the internet has really empowered you know, the concept of creative destruction. And you know, while it took over 100 years for the first Dow 30 to be completely turned over, you know, the top 10 internet companies of a decade ago are all gone and there's a new group taking their place. So I think there's still a lot of innovation and new business formation to happen. Got it. Okay. Yeah, it's going to be quite interesting. Um, and I guess, Carolyn, I don't want to steal your thunder, but we mm -hmm. find ourselves that we're talking about DC here. We're in a lame duck FCC. I, I guess if, from your seat, what do you see as important issues they can address if they can address them at all? You know, the FCC was designed for a regulated monopoly world. And, you know, each network had its own attributes and was regulated separately. The internet is different. It's a network that had no purpose, which makes regulation more difficult. Secondly, it's an overlay network. It sits on top of either twisted pair, coax, mobile wireless, fixed wireless, or fiber. Now, fiber is superior. There is, I think, a broad view in the developed world, US and other developed countries, that there is a social benefit in private capital, fiber connecting their entire footprints with universal service. We saw in the you know, broadband stimulus funding in the infrastructure bill, you know, I think the U.S.'s attempt to address that market. I think the FCC's biggest issue, which still has not been fully resolved, is net neutrality. And, you know, what does the free flow of information mean? You know, I think also you see things such as 230 regulation bleeding into that and being somewhat conflated. So I think there really does need to be a new regulatory paradigm that would allow for private capital to come in, get adequate returns to modernize US infrastructure, and to do so in a way that does not limit the competition at the access layer. And then finally, holding access application companies responsible for the services that they sell. You know, 230 gives a lot of contact companies an umbrella that allow them to write algorithms that monetize very destructive content and they're not held accountable. They're the ones writing the algorithms that are promoting that content. So they definitely have culpability, if not control. So there are a number of issues. And I'm not maybe as pessimistic as you that we're in a complete lame duck with this. <laughs> well, actually, let me follow up on that. Um, you, you mentioned, you know, DC writ large needs a new paradigm, but specifically FCC, what, what, any thoughts on what that new paradigm should look like, or even in breast, very, very broad brushstrokes? Yeah, I, and this is going to sound strange for someone who is an entrepreneur to say this, but local access is a monopoly, and we should have structural separation with large monopoly franchises with promulgated rates of return and open access and structural separation that would allow private capital to come in and modernize the infrastructure of the United States without destroying shareholder and bondholder value. I think secondly, that network 
has to be separated from the service layer. So a company that builds network is prohibited from being in the service business, either through subsidiaries or sister companies. And those networks need to be made available to application and service providers on a promulgated rate that gives an adequate rate of return. For those services, those business models could range from free internet access to premium paid services or very selective applications. You know, there could be a myriad of uses of the infrastructure. And then for the companies that are putting applications out, they need to be held accountable for those applications. Even if they are only monetizing them by placing ads, they still have an incentive to focus those ads to the largest number of people. And in doing so, they're making a number of publishing decisions. You know, our model today is for a world where we had to broadcast because it was prohibitively expensive to unicast. The internet made unicasting possible. It has caused more societal fragmentation. So while we've all got this global public square to communicate on, we also have, I think for the first time, the ability to customize content to the individual level. You marry that with, you know, pattern recognition or AI, and you could end up with a world where 5.3 billion people all see 5.3 diff billion different versions of the same truth. And that's something that we're not ready to regulate yet. Dave, last question. I mean, I was watching CNBC this morning and they're all in Davos again. And three years, they were reminded about three years ago, it was only, I think, one man, Paul Tudor Jones, who talked about maybe this coronavirus is something to watch. Is there any sort of black swan event you see worried about? I mean, beyond a recession, I don't know what your thoughts are. Yeah, and clearly, you know, pandemics and viruses have hit mankind for thousands of years. And, you know, I think Bill Gates was credited in 2015 and saying microbes are more dangerous than nuclear weapons. And, you know, I am sure we will have many challenges of society. I'm going to actually take the black swan question in the opposite direction, which is, what is something that could happen that can really make things a lot better, okay. a lot worse? Mm -hmm. And I think that black swan is really a much more immersive internet than we have today. You know, the internet today is basically two-dimensional graphic. I think we will see ergonomically acceptable AR and VR devices, a much more immersive technology. You can even send a uh, sense across the internet today. You can send motion across the internet. These are very crude, but I think the, you know, while we're not going to be on Star Trek transporting ourselves, we will be able to have a much more realistic uh, interaction, which will empower a whole new generation of applications. You know, we're just getting started, for example, with telemedicine. You know, we're still seeing people's life expectancies rise. I know for the past few years that hasn't happened in the U.S. because of the pandemic, but the general trend is increasing life expectancy. And we have a long way to go. And, you know, again, the internet and the very inexpensive and ubiquitous collection of data is going to just empower a whole new way of interacting with the world. You know, I'll close with one example. You know, the way the Fed and the government looks at monetary policy with surveys and estimates in the rearview mirror, to me, is literally like a neurosurgeon using a pick and shovel to work on someone's head. 
We have today the ability today where over 90% of economic transactions are done through credit cards to real time on an anonymized basis, analyze those trends, correlate those with tax returns, and really understand with much more precision what the consequences of both monetary and physical policy are. You know, we may not end the common cold, we may not end the business cycle, but we can make both of these much more benign. And I think the internet will help do that. And I think there's some good black swans out there. That's a great way to leave it. Let me just throw this out and, and get your reaction as we close. Uh, the, the, one of the current rumors inside the Beltway is in fact, maybe we will see a default on the debt. What are your thoughts if that happens? You know, the only reason paper currency has value is because people have trust in governments. We as a society are based on trust, you know, from contracts to personal relationships. And, you know, we no longer have a gold standard. We no longer have any kind of limited resource. You know, crypto was an attempt to come up with a government independent of uh, you know, scarce resource that could be tied to exchange and store value. Very, very inefficient. All crypto is, is wasted in stored electricity. Uh, you know, that's a very ESG unfriendly and also a very bad situation. But a default, I think, would shake people's confidence in a way that they have not seen to date. And once that confidence is broken, it's very hard to regain it. So I would really sincerely hope that Democrats and Republicans get together and at least understand that you have to fund what has already been spent. You know, we as a society have done a great job of spending more than we take in. You know. We take in about between 17 and 18% of GDP at the federal level, and we spend about 23%. Now, you could say France is terrible spending 55% of GDP on government actions. That's probably is wrong. You know, capitalism is great. It produces things far more efficiency, efficiently than any other system, but it has defects, and we really need to make sure that we have all of the infrastructure. And if it costs 25%, fund it and move on. There's some number that is required to fund a civilized society. You know, we're not all going to be cavemen with no rules. Well, Dave, that's a great place to end it. I will tell you that as an analyst, I learned most from Dave as a, a oh, CEO. Yeah. I remember him when uh, Google purchased YouTube and he said, this is going to be something to watch. So how right his words were then. And um, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out from here. Dave, thank you so much. This was great. And we're really happy you kicked off our series for 2023. Hey, thank you all very, very much. Everyone take care and have a great day. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Appreciate it. Jen, have a good one. Thanks. Bye, everyone.